Hey everyone and good morning. My name is Ryan Clark. I'm EM faculty at Bay State Medical Center. Uh, I did a master's in medical education uh, at Penn. My interests really lie in things like simulation and resuscitation and specifically communication in the resuscitation room. So I'm going to start the lecture now. So good morning. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. My name is Ryan Clark. I'm um, EMF faculty at Bay State Medical Center. And today I have the pleasure of talking to you about skin and soft tissue infections. I know what you're thinking, not exactly the sexiest topic in emergency medicine. This doesn't involve ketamine or Haldol or TXA, but it's something that's common. And more importantly, it's something that's commonly misdiagnosed and commonly inappropriately treated. So we know the risk factors for skin and soft tissue infections. We know things like IV drug use, diabetes, immunocompromise, right, venous stasis, none of these things are going away. So common, but unfortunately commonly mismanaged. Today there's really going to be focus on three things. The first is going to be differentiating purulent versus non-purulent cellulitis and why that's important. And I'm going to make a push for everyone to use bedside ultrasound whenever they see a soft tissue infection. The second thing we're going to discuss is discharge instructions and what exactly we mean by the failed outpatient uh, cellulitis. Third thing, and importantly, and really the cool part of this, is necrotizing soft tissue infections. When to suspect them and what to do about them when you think about it. So let's talk about that first question, purulent versus non-purulent. So pus versus no pus, right? And this may seem trivial, but it's really important, right? Because purulent cellulitis is a surgical disease, non-purulent cellulitis is a medical disease, and I really want you to think of them as two different entities. The second question is something that we do all the time, right? We risk stratify. Is this mild? Is this moderate? Is this severe disease? What does the patient look like? And really that's our job in emergency medicine and something that we're, we're used to. So really, whenever you see a soft tissue infection, really ask these two questions and think about it like this. So let's talk a bit about the difference between purulent and non-purulent cellulitis. Purulent cellulitis, pus, right? So typically, we're thinking of a central abscess and then a surrounding cellulitis, usually a kind of a circular pattern around the central abscess. And these tend to be closer to the trunk, in the axilla, thigh, buttocks. Compare that with a non-purulent cellulitis, which tends to be circumferential around the limb, right? This looks red, this looks angry, as you see in this picture, but typically this is, for example, lower down in the extremity. So it's elbow and below, it's knee and below, usually with some existing edema in the area. So, Right, this seems simple when you look at pictures like this. Pus, no pus. But it's not always that easy. So I think all of us have probably had the experience in which you think that you have a non purulent cellulitis and later on come to find out that there's an abscess and it needs surgical drainage. So here's my push. Everyone should get a bedside ultrasound when they have a skin and soft tissue infection. And it's simple and it's really easy. All you need is a linear transducer and some gel. Um, and here's kind of what the anatomy looks like. It's pretty straightforward. Granted, our patients may have a little bit more sub-Q than this, but really what you're looking for is that kind of lacy reticular pattern of the sub-Q, followed by that hyperechoic line of fascia. Beneath that, you're gonna get muscle, which looks striated, and then bone, which has a really hyperechoic line. So really simple. Let's look at it kind of uh, in a video clip. So here, what you see is the sub-Q at the top again, lacy reticular, that fascia beneath it, and then muscle. So pretty straightforward and pretty easy. We're not asking you to find anything too advanced. Let's contrast this with a purulent cellulitis. And so this is pretty classic, right? They're not all gonna look like this. This is uh, pretty, pretty striking. So you have this hypoechoic area in the center, usually heterogeneous looking. You have this kind of a, a capsule underneath it, which can be enhancing. And then here, what we're showing you is what's called the squish test. So you're seeing all of this pus move around when you push down on it. Very good to diagnose abscesses, very bad for the patient because it's super painful, um, but pretty classic for a, uh, an abscess. Let's compare that with a non-purulent cellulitis. So this is what we classically call cobblestoning. So in that sub-Q space, you get this kind of pockets of fluid and edema, and this is nonspecific. You can actually see this in things like chronic inflammation, even stasis dermatitis or uh, edema of the lower extremities. But this, in the right clinical uh, picture, suggests a non-purulent cellulitis. So again, you should be ultrasounding all of these. The second question becomes to, how sick is the patient? And I don't need to teach you how to do this, we do this every day. But really, skin and soft tissue infections run the gamut of mild, right? 
people with no comorbidities, looking systemically well, too severe, right? And anytime that you see a severe cellulitis, I really want you to think about necrotizing soft tissue infection. A quick aside and a quick PSA to everyone. We know that about a fifth of cases of uh, cellulitis or skin and soft tissue infections, or sorry, a fifth of cases of sepsis won't have a discernible cause. What you need to do for everyone with sepsis or fever, NOS, that we don't know a cause, is really strip and flip them. We need to see everything. We need to see all the cracks, all the crevices. You need to be looking under nut sacks and in butt cracks to find all these things because it is very, very embarrassing when the medicine resident diagnoses the cellulitis up on the floor four hours later because you didn't look under their pants or you didn't look into, their, uh, into all the folds. So really a quick PSA, make sure that everyone is undressed and that you take a look at everything. Uh, so let's switch gears and let's talk about purulent cellulitis. Let's talk about some pus. And really what happens here is that there's some level of entry into the skin. There's something that happens, whether that's breakdown from things like tinea pedis or chronic edema and venous stasis changes, or there's, a, for example, a laceration. There's a heavy bac bacterial load that goes underneath the skin and into the soft tissue. And really this starts to break down the soft tissue itself. You get this liquefactor necrosis, you get this kind of uh, this rim that encapsulates it, and you get a, a large abscess. And we are seeing an increased number of abscesses. A lot of this is related to IV drug abuse, but a lot of this is just kind of the natural, uh, is the increase in MRSA. So from the 90s on, we've been seeing this kind of one specific monoclonal type, the US 300, which I assume is a pretty patriotic type of MRSA, um, that's really been spreading. So it's fairly common uh, for MRSA to be uh, pretty endemic. So when we're talking about um, this purulent cellulitis, really what we're talking again about is MRSA. This is the causative agent in over 75% of cases. With IVDU that we're seeing more often, we are seeing anaerobes uh, and gram negatives. And a lot of times what will happen is that people will clean their, their needles with saliva and you'll introduce different bacteria uh, to cause an abscess. So like we talked about, we're going to ultrasound all of these, right? They're, it's easy to do. It's quick. We can, we can do this at the bedside. But the question always becomes, when do we CT these? And really, there's not any specific guideline as to which ones need definitively to be CT'd. Um, but if these are large abscesses, things that are likely going to go to surgery, or if they're in sensitive areas, like the neck, um, where there's a lot of trouble that you can get into, or the perineum, or the perirectal space, then it's probably reasonable to get a CT scan. So let's talk a bit about treatment. So we know that this is a surgical disease. This is something that we need to open up. We need to take that pus and open it up to the environment. But the way that we think about IND has changed and it's changed fairly recently. So the first question always becomes irrigation. Is it useful in this setting? It's pretty much only useful for one thing and that's spreading MRSA all around uh, what you're doing. Um, Really, it hasn't been shown to improve outcomes. A lot of the literature is mostly in pediatrics, but even in the adult literature, it really doesn't improve things. The next question is packing. Do we really need it? Um, packing can be painful for patients, but it's thought to be helpful in large or deep abscesses. And again, there really isn't much data to suggest that this improves outcomes. The last thing I want to talk about is the technique of an actual incision and drainage. And we kind of classically do a large incision, we express uh, some purulence out of this, and then we break up loculations. What I want to ask you to do the next time you do this is to consider the loop drainage technique. And this is something um, that has been shown to improve uh, treatment outcomes and, and kind of uh, decrease the rates of recidivism uh, for abscesses and purulent cellulitis. And basically, you're doing something very similar to what you do now. You make an incision in the pocket that's the most fluctuant, you break up loculations, you drain this, but then you kind of explore it with a hemostat and you have another um, basically um, cut in the skin. You pull through something like a Penrose drain or what I like to use is a trim sterile tourniquet and then you tie this off in a bow. And this allows us to stay open and drain and the patient themselves can, can you know, cut this off and take this out five to seven days later. So who really needs antibiotics in the setting of uh, purulent cellulitis. This is something that has been a, a topic of contention. There's a lot of debate over who should get antibiotics. Some people will say all of these should get antibiotics based on some RCTs. Some should say, some say really not, not many people should get it. Kind of what, what I think are the things that we agree upon is anyone with systemic system, symptoms, anyone that's immunocompromised, 
anyone with a large area of abscess or cellulitis may, may benefit from antibiotics. And here we're talking about anti-MRSA, talking about things like Bactrim, and typically uh, double-strength Bactrim, doxycycline, clindamycin, etc. <clears throat> so then discharge instructions. First of all, who should be admitted? And again, anyone that has severe systemic symptoms, if it requires a surgical drainage, if they have a rapidly expanding extensive cellulitis, or if they have poor social support or underlying psychiatric disease and they're not gonna be able to get the care that they need, may be reasonable to admit them. When we discharge people with uh, purulent cellulitis, it's really important that you talk to them about what they should expect. So you want them to wash these out with warm water and soap. Um, if they have packing in place or if they have an overlying cellulitis, you wanna mark that off and you wanna give them follow-up at 48 hours to see how this, is, how this is going from there. As we discussed, MRSA is the causative agent pretty much all the time in these abscesses, um, and you wanna to talk to people about kind of uh, taking care of the MRSA. And by that, I mean, you want them to avoid skin-to-skin -skin contact with others, you want them uh, to wash any surfaces that they might disinfect or close, you don't wanna spread this, right? We know that there's probably somewhere around 15% of people with a purulent cellulitis will have a recurrence within the year, and that's likely because we're not taking care of uh, the underlying issue, which is kind of this exposure to, to MRSA. So let's pivot and talk about the non-purulent cellulitis. So as opposed to a, a purulent cellulitis or an abscess, this really doesn't have much by way of bacteria. This, what happens is you get some bacteria that kind of break, comes through an entry point in the skin, and then it's really mediated by cytokines and uh, bacterial toxins that do this. And as opposed to MRSA being equated with uh, purulent cellulitis. Non-purulent cellulitis is typically a beta hemolytic strep, right, and MSSA. So less than 4% of causes in case series are actually from MRSA. Plus, there's a whole lot of other stuff that can happen, right? And we think about this dog bites, cat bites, right, human bites, saltwater, freshwater. There's different, there's other different uh, pathogens that can be uh, implicated in this. So just, you know, when you get a history, make sure that you understand kind of what the situation was uh, surrounding this soft tissue infection. And on exam, what's classic is what we know, right? Erythema with indistinct margins, redness, tenderness. But it's not always that. There can be things like lymphangitis. There can be, you know, tender regional lymphadenopathy. You can have this intense fiery red um, erythema with bulla involving the epidermis. So it's, classic is not always, it is not always there. There's other ways that this can present. Importantly, under this umbrella of non-purulent cellulitis is erysipelas, and it's something that you need to look for, right? And this is characterized by involvement of the lymphatic system. So it's raised and it's red, um, but more often this happens in the, the extremes of age, the very old and the very young. And more often than not, actually, this is involved with a kind of acute onset of symptoms, and a lot of people will have systemic symptoms and toxicity, and sometimes this is related to the strep toxin, and they can have even strep toxic shock syndrome. When we talk about mimics, we all know things like DBT and inflammatory arthropathies like gout and, and septic arthritis, but the common one that we kind of where we fall down on is stasis dermatitis. And this is a chronic inflammation of the, um, the skin and soft tissue seen in people that usually have underlying venous stasis changes. And the tell here is that this is typically symmetric and bilateral, right? You can get a bilateral cellulitis, that happens, but it's pretty rare. So if you see bilateral cellulitis in a patient with underlying venous stasis changes, the majority of the time, think stasis dermatitis, and right, this is gonna be treated very differently. This is a topical steroid as compared to antibiotics. And then, you know, who needs to be admitted? Who needs IV antibiotics? Who can just go home with PO antibiotics? Who needs MRSA coverage? These are all important questions and things to consider. Before we get there, there's other things to talk to your patients about other than antibiotics. So really what you wanna do is have them elevate the extremity if it's on an extremity. You want them taking NSAIDs if they can to decrease inflammation. But the important thing here is that you wanna address underlying predisposing factors, right? If that patient has tinea and that was the cause of breakdown, address their tinea. If they have CHF and they have lower extremity edema, you wanna address that too. Again, there's a high rate of recurrence for these things because we don't really talk about the predisposing conditions. And maybe that lies more under primary care, but for us in the emergency department, it's important to have that discussion with the patient.
who gets admitted? And, and really this is about the severity of disease and underlying risk factors. So anyone that has systemic symptoms that looks pretty sick and you don't think is gonna get better um, at home, right? Anyone that has a, a cellulitis with involvement of an indwelling device, whether that's a prosthetic joint, an ASCD, a vascular graft, you might wanna consider admission for that. And similar for IV antibiotics with admission, those two kind of go hand in hand, right? Systemic toxicity, rapidly spreading erythema, uh, and then uh, clo being close to an indwelling device, right? Patients with MRSA, when do you cover for MRSA? If they've had previous MRSA infections, if they look systemically unwell, right, and they're gonna be admitted with IV antibiotics, probably reasonable to broaden your coverage because even though it's less than 4% of these cases, it still does happen. Um, so that's probably a, a good place to start. And then discharge instructions for those places, that, the people that are going home. All of these should be marked, right? You should be at the leading edge with a marker and, and mark these off not for yourself, for the patient, for their follow-up. And I think this is where we fall down in terms of discharge instructions and why we see a lot of bounce backs for cellulitis specifically. So you need to talk to your patient about what to expect and what's the natural course of a non-purulent cellulitis. Within that first 24 hours after starting antibiotics, it actually may get more red. What's happening is that the antibiotics typically are working. You get bacterial breakdown and release of cytokines and it can get a little bit more intense and red. Over 40, like the next, 24 hours, 48 hours after, after leaving and starting antibiotics, know that this should get a little bit more subtle in terms of color. It shouldn't be as red and as fiery, but what's important is that to tell patients that it, it probably is gonna spread beyond that marker that you've, that you've drawn. That's normal, that's okay, and that's really expected. So what we're talking about in terms of failure is that 48, 72 hours, it's worse, it's red, they, still, they have systemic symptoms. That really is what constitutes a failure. And if you have a failure of your outpatient antibiotics, really think about what exactly the cause is, right? If you're treating a non-purulent cellulitis, but you know, the previous provider or yourself didn't do an ultrasound, really ultrasound that. Is there an abscess underneath? Are we really mistreating this? And then to the last part, and let's talk about necrotizing infections. So this is, this is the important thing, right? This is the emergency diagnosis that we're looking for. And what's so tough about this is really what this is, is clinical suspicion. And that's basically all you have in your armamentarium to, uh, to address this. So necrotizing soft tissue infections, it's an umbrella term that includes necrotizing cellulitis, fasciitis, and myositis. It's really characterized by severe disease and systemic toxicity, very high mortality rate with these. We have names for these in certain areas, right? Fourniers in the perineum, Ludwig's angina in the submandibular space, but these are these are very very severe diseases, and they're tough to diagnose. Over 50% of the time, we miss this on the initial presentation, and that's tough. And a lot of times, you don't even need to have overlying soft tissue changes if it's a necrotizing myositis or a fasciitis. All you might have is some overlying redness, and and a patient with risk factors. The first patient I ever saw with necrotizing fasciitis, I was an intern. And this gentleman had a colonoscopy two days earlier, um, came in with testicular pain and swelling. He died in the OR two hours later. And when he came in, he was systemically well appearing um, and, and looked otherwise okay. Um, so it's a very rapidly moving diagnosis that we need to have high clinical suspicion for. So when we think about the causes and really what does this, we're, it's an uncommon disease in general, but we're seeing actually an increased incidence, which makes sense when you think about risk factors. IV drug abuse, right? Diabetes, cirrhosis. Uh, other risk factors include recent surgery and even childbirth and clostridium myonecrosis. Wounds that happen in aquatic areas are all at higher risk. Classically, we think of two types, type one and type two. For us in the emergency department, we, it really doesn't matter so much. We're gonna cover this with broad spectrum antibiotics and consult as necessary. Type one is usually polymicrobial, and this usually involves an anaerobic species, um, plus strep, plus minus uh, enterobacter. Um, that's usually things like Fourniers and our Ludwig's angina. Type two is monomicrobial, and this is typically either staph or strep, more commonly strep. And what happens here is you get the strep toxin, uh, which mediates the severe disease. So something to look out for. Other types of monomicrobial include Vibrio from salt water and Aromotus from, from fresh water. So the presentation, when this presents late, this is easy, right? 
they have hemorrhagic bulla, they're systemically unwell, they look terrible, right? But our job is to catch this early. And again, we often miss this on the initial presentation. So what really are you looking for? And this is important. So what you're looking for is someone with risk factors, right? The things that we just talked about. But also what you're looking for is things like pain out of proportion to exam. And you're really looking for tenderness beyond the margins of what appears to be a cellulitis. So if they have a small cellulitis and they have tenderness, you know, around that area, really think about this. And it's your job to have a high clinical suspicion because this can get missed. So imaging, what do we do? We know plain films aren't great for this, but you know, 25% sensitivity for subcutaneous gas. CT does a little bit better, and it's probably, you know, sometimes it is a reasonable thing to, to do. It's sensitive, but it's not all that specific, and really what you're looking for is gas in the tissues. We talked a lot about bedside ultrasound, and I think that is something that is somewhat useful here, right? If you have suspicion, it's probably useful to take a look and see if you have subcutaneous emphysema. Um, the sensitivity and specificity in some studies has been shown to be as, as high as in the low 90s. Um, I wouldn't hang my hat on this, right? There's no specific way to diagnose this. Let's take a look at what you might expect. So what you're really looking for is subcutaneous thickening below that air, and then you're gonna get this dirty shadowing below that on ultrasound. Here's an example from our department that happened recently. So similar, right? You get the subcutaneous thickening, you get a pocket of air that can look uh, hyperechoic, and then you get this dirty shadowing underneath. And what's important to, to recognize here is that you can have gas and air in an abscess, but this is gas and air along the fascial plane. So imaging really isn't helpful. Labs certainly aren't helpful or specific in the setting. There's a whole number of kind of um, uh, different uh, scoring systems for this, and none of them do well. Really, the diagnosis is made with a surgeon's eye. This is made by opening up this tissue, and what they're looking for is this kind of gray, non-adherent fascia uh, or soft tissue, and that's really the gold standard. So when you have clinical suspicion for a necrotizing soft tissue infection, you really need to call the surgeon. As much as sometimes we don't like to do that in emergency medicine, you really need them at the bedside. There's places where people practice, if there's not surgical coverage, that they'll actually just use a scalpel and they'll open up a small amount of this tissue and see what it looks like. But really, really, it's a clinical suspicion and a discussion with surgery because ultimately you need source control. You need to debride this tissue until you get to viable tissue. What can we do in emergency medicine? Really, our job is going to be focusing on resuscitation and broad spectrum antibiotics, right? So clinical suspicion, discussion with surgery, and then we're going to, we're going to be resuscitating these people. Time to debridement is the most important thing in terms of outcomes, but really we want to stabilize their hemodynamics. In terms of what we're using in this setting, usually broad spectrum, right? Vancomycin and Zosin is a good example. Carbapenems do fairly well as well. Um, but importantly, you want to add on clindamycin. So like we talked about in that type 2 uh, necrotizing soft tissue infection caused by strep, there's this toxin. And what clindamycin does is it decreases um, the ability of that toxin to spread and, and, and helps in that way. The other thing you might want to think about is doxycycline. And this is specific for any lacerations that happen in water. Aromonas and Vibrio, both you want to add on doxycycline. At this point, this patient's sick, right? Adding on additional antibiotics, really no harm. You can only benefit them at this point uh, in the game. So in terms of my takeaways from this, really use an ultrasound on all soft tissue uh, infections. It's just helpful. Sometimes we, we miss these abscesses. Just take a look. It's quick, it's easy, and it's inexpensive. I want you to let your patients know what to expect, specifically in the setting of a non purulent cellulitis. You're gonna mark this, but what should they look for at 48, 72 hours? What constitutes failure? And then with necrotizing soft tissue infections, really think about it with pain out of portion to exam in the setting of the right risk factors and any pain spreading beyond the margins of a cellulitis. Just think about S uh, necrotizing soft tissue infections. It's our job to have a high clinical suspicion. That's all I have. Thank you so much for having me uh, and all the best. Thank you very much, that was great. Can I ask you one quick question? Sure. Um, so you mentioned all the imaging studies, it's looking for gas, ultrasound for gas, x-ray for gas. How common is gas in necrotizing fasciitis? Because I thought that strep often wasn't gas forming, 
and therefore we couldn't exclude on the basis of not finding gas, which is a conversation I have all the time. With yeah, patients. yeah, it is very much true. That's and that's a great point, and that's why I think all imaging studies uh, kind of fall down, right? And again, our our job is clinical suspicion and discussion with surgery. Gas is the most uh, sensitive finding, um, but again, it's it's not always there. So I think it's a really good point. All right. Thank you. Any so other questions? Much for Thank, you Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys.